Today's uh, special guest speaker is a guy that I met about a year ago, uh, one of the leaders in his field. Without any further ado, I'd like to give it up for Dennis Shields. Thanks, Ted, for allowing me this opportunity. I'm actually excited about this. It's interesting for me to watch these videos and hear you guys speak because I look at myself as an entrepreneurial and what I am is currently, I'm the chairman of a bank, a nationally chartered bank. I'm the owner of probably the third largest specialty finance business in America. I own a pretty big payment processing company. And I looked at all these entrepreneurial things and at some point you reach a size and you become institutional, which I never actually thought that would happen to myself because I started business when I was your age. And, and tell you two quick uh, funny stories. One, before I get to how I get started, is Ted uh, made the comment, don't, don't, um, don't think you're your own customer. So what I would start off telling entrepreneurs is two things. One, know your numbers. You have to know your numbers and you have to know your numbers cold. You saw two presentations and the first thing I want to understand is what my cost to acquire a client, what my cost of goods are, and the cost and understanding and measuring where you are is so incredibly important. So I have 17 different businesses that I'm the CEO, chairman, or sit on boards. Almost all of them meet monthly, uh, quarterly, and there are businesses where I get daily reports, weekly reports, monthly reports. But this is so important to know your own numbers and so you never fool yourself and you never want to fool yourself with, with, with numbers. Um, number two, whatever business you're going into, I always looked at the entrepreneurial focus. Two great things about it. One, you should be looking to solve a problem. Whatever business you're going in should be answering some problem or void in the market. And, and the great thing about entrepreneurship and why it works so well is almost every successful entrepreneur, who start, they started with Richard Branson, was not understanding that you shouldn't be able to get done what you do get done as an entrepreneur. So there was all this talk, failure, failure, failure. I actually never looked at failure. I looked at if somebody said, no, that wasn't failure, I was gonna go on and on and on. And I started my business, I'll tell you how I started in a minute, at, 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 when I was your age. And I'll tell you how it started. But Ted gave me a laugh when he said, know your own customer. Because we own a big media agency. And we have a company which does micro loans. It's the largest of its type in the United States. And we had, when you get into business, you, always, you have a million people always asking you and making suggestions, meet with this person, meet with that person. So somebody asked us who was an investor in another company to meet with this media agency about doing a buy. And they show us a commercial ad for this consumer loan and everybody in the room sits there and says, this is terrible, this is awful. And it was about giving people money and the ad, the first part of the ad, was a guy was on a bus and they stuck money in his pocket. Instead of a pickpocket, it was a reverse. And then the guy sees he's got his money and he's so happy and then it says borrow money from us or something like that. So we all thought this was terrible and the guy looks at me who was the head of the ad agency and says, that's great because you are not the customer and you're not who we're trying to drive to. We spent $600,000 on the media campaign and it was a total loser. It turned out that we were, we, we, we were right. So sometimes you do know your, your own customer. But how, how I started out in business was I was 18 or 19, I think I was 18, and I, had, I, I wasn't altruistic. I had this idea, I wanted to make a million dollars before I was 21. That was my entire reason for going into business. And, I, and it wasn't, I didn't have a logic to it. It wasn't, I didn't have a use like I was gonna take the million dollars. So that, that, was, that was my start. My, my love of, people say you should do something you love. My love was I wanted to make a million dollars. So I was doing an internship. I was, I was a sophomore at NYU and I was doing an internship that I got through the school program for a Supreme Court judge in Kings County. And I had a, my, my, the extent of my internship was carrying his mail or picking it up when it went to the wrong place. It was not a very active internship. But 
In the middle of the internship, there was a doctor who was testifying on a case where a building had collapsed. And um, he was a doctor who was educated in non-American medical school. And I couldn't understand a word he said. And he's testifying before a jury on, on these injuries. And finally, he gets to the point where they said, how much money a year do you make testifying? And the guy says, $1.2 million. And I was thinking, I wouldn't bring my family pet to this guy. And he's making, and this is a 1987. So I said, you know, I started to learn, and I did my own research and did presentations similar to the ones you guys did. And I said, what if I could get high quality doctors to give these, these typical people who are either injured in accidents or injured on the job, high quality medical service. And so I begin and I study and I try and understand reimbursement rates. And again, I was, I, I didn't understand anything. And if anybody, would, if I would have brought this plan in, Ted and you guys would have laughed and said, this is ridiculous. This will never work. Why will the doctors talk to you? Why will the unions talk to you? Uh, so I approached a group of doctors. I said, you know, Medicare rates seem to be going down in this country. And I talked an orthopedic group who was at a pretty big hospital, a neurological group, into providing coverage. Then I went and I went door to door. And it was a lesson that I never forgot because there were people. Now, as I said, I'm the chairman of the bank. Anybody who wants to see me, it was a very good lesson in humility having thousands of doors slammed in your face. But I took all these things, and my idea was simple, providing high-quality medical care to people who don't traditionally uh, get it. I started with one office. I, I scraped together the money. Um, I made, as a kid, shoveling snow and things like this to, to open my first office. That business within, and I went door to door to doctors and to unions, and I went to emergency rooms to meet with people who were sending people out for after care. And I'd say I maybe had a 2% hit rate. That business ended up, before I sold it, at its height seeing about 45,000 patients a year, doing about 85 million in sales and making about 16 million a year in profit. And, and by the time I was, when I was 20, so the business starts, and you learn a lot of lessons, and all these things that you don't think will happen, happen, and, um, but again, it was right away, I was very good at getting testimonials. So we provided a really, really high quality service. I tracked waiting time. We gave food to people who were in the waiting rooms. We made sure that we provided transportation. One thing led to another. I started to notice that I was sending out a lot of MRIs, that the business was sending out a lot of MRIs. I said, I should go into the MRI business. And again, I'm 20 years old, so an MRI machine at that time you know, cost half a million dollars. So I said, well, how am I gonna finance this? I have this business, it's making a little bit of money. And I said, well, I'm sending MRIs to three places. Why don't I go to these places and say, I'm gonna pull my MRI business regardless. I need you to lend me money to finance an MRI machine. <laughs> so I went, they, they bought off on it. And again, and again, it was, it was like, if somebody told or somebody asked, Ted, can you get that done? The answer was probably no. They would have said, take the business else. Uh, like, but I was persistent. So then what happened in the MRI business was the laws were changing and I became aware of something called the stock amendment. And the stock amendment, and this is knowing your customer, basically was a rule which was changing how self-referral was working in the United States for MRIs and for blood labs, meaning that you couldn't, the, I don't want to get too technical, but what, how MRIs were traditionally owned was there's one GP and all these limited partners. And the thought was that was causing too much referral and costing the, the government money. So they wanted to get rid of it and, it, and it was wrong. It was wrong that they got rid of it. It was really, there was more usage. But I realized that a high volume physician or distressed hospital could use these MRIs. They were an effective tool. You could practice better medicine. So I came up with numbers, just like what I was saying, with know your own numbers, where I would go into a distressed hospital and, and, and I, we were at Kings County Hospitals, one of the first hospitals we got. And we went in and I said, 
I'm going to enable you to practice better medicine. You're going to attract doctors. I'm going to finance it, and you're going to make a click fee. So it's 20 years. I've, again, I had five MRIs. I was a junior in, in college. And I would go to school in the morning, and then I would work every night. And like I said, half these things were because I didn't know that I shouldn't get them done. But the other half was <laughs> I knew what my weaknesses were, and I was able pretty quickly to bring in other people who could help support the business. That business, just as, as just to tell you that where, so no failure, I got approached before I graduated from college by a small investment banker. He said, we love this business model, we want to take it public. We took the business public, then within a year, we sold it to another company for I think $36 million. And I had just graduated from, from college. And, and, and I think that the, the, lessons that I, the lessons that I learned that would be valuable were, I did exactly what Ted says. There was a need, these, there was a certain type of, certain type of, uh, certain person who got injured, who needed medical care. I was able to provide um, high quality medical care. I began to see there were off, offshoots of the service. I financed it how most entrepreneurs financing just sort of beg, begging and borrowing and getting it done. But the main thing was I always knew my numbers. And every week I would look at my numbers and say, okay, I have 78 MRIs, my radiology costs are this. You have to know your numbers. The biggest reason businesses in my mind fail are execution. There's so many good business ideas, and I look at the, the, the place where you guys are sitting now, and it, 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 it's so much easier to be an entrepreneur. It's so much easier to get the word out there. I was, when I, when I first started with television advertising, there were, there were like three people tele, television advertising. And even how that business has changed, when you look at the support or, you know, we have businesses where we pay people on Twitter and we have people, we have one person who has 22 million followers who endorses a, 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 a soft drink that, uh, that we have. And the ability to get to the public and build businesses today is so much easier than it was years ago. And the idea of businesses where you need bricks and mortars, the, the internet, you look, you look at companies, I don't know how much you guys have spent on, on crowdfunding or know about what crowdfunding is. But basically, crowdfunding is um, a means of finance based on the Job Act, Jobs Act, which is going to disintermediate, disintermediate how traditional financing is done. But when you look at what technology is and where business is done, you look at all these business and all the wealth that's get, getting created. Um, and so I would say as a young, young entrepreneur, there are inefficiencies in the market and the ability to access and get ability to, to reach out to clients in clever ways is, is so much of a better avenue today. You look at a company like Uber. And you say, what is Uber? Uber is a, G G a GPS. What is it? All it is is it's a GPS system. And Uber went in, and they went into places where New York City taxi cab medallions have risen in price every year since 1940. There's, there's no business. Medallions hit a height of about a year and a half ago of a million two. And Uber went in and was said, we're going to provide a better product. We're going to have cleaner cars. We're going to do A, B, C, and D. And we're going to do this. And it was a business plan, and today Uber is worth, they're raising money now at a $60 billion evaluation. So the, there's more opportunity now than ever before, but I keep going back to the same things. Look for a product that, that, solves, an, that solves a problem. Crowdfunding is, is a good business in the sense it's a company called Lending Club and it's a company called Kickstart. Those are probably the two biggest crowdfunding companies. And the idea of crowdfunding really is to, there are a lot of different financial service products that only the wealthy have access to. So the government said, we're not going, we think that everybody should be able to invest, not the elite, and we're gonna make, 
we're going to make it easy for you to get, be able to get your message out to the general public. So a lending club, what lending club does is they do small loans, peer-to-peer -peer loans, and they put, say, that you're a college student, and you had your business plan. You put your business club, you, your business plan wouldn't be for lending club, but say for Kickstarter. You put your business plan on for Kickstarter, you go on, you say why it works, people contribute money. Kickstarter is a non, what's called equity or debt website, so you may give them a $20 credit on your product. They like your product, they support your product, and it's just new ways uh, of raising money. But the whole idea now is, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, if you had a good idea, in order to get to the public, raise money, was so much more difficult than, than today. So you know, what I would say to some, to, as a young entrepreneur, get your plan, really understand your product. Don't, as Ted said, you know, don't test it amongst three friends. There's tons and tons of ways of testing it. They, you know, and there's so many easier ways, like building a logo. There's a company, I think it's called 99 Logos. And what they do is you go online and they have a contest. And it's say $500, I think, for the winner. So you have lots of high-level advertising guys who on the weekends go onto this site and they enter the contest to, to make money. So there are so many different great products out there. Um, and what I would say is define what you want your product to be. You know, you were talking about going to work at JetBlue when we started. It's a very good, the easiest way as an entrepreneur to learn about a business or if you have a business idea is on somebody else's dime. So it, it's not a bad idea to go work for a company in a similar business or and learn what they do. The cheapest dollar is the way to learn on somebody else's mistakes. Everybody's going to make mistakes in, in business. It's funny to see all these things where they say, yeah, I, I, I talk about lending and, and lending, we end up with owning airplanes and art and all these things and people say, well, you know, you must be a good lender. I said, no, that actually means I'm a bad lender if I'm taking the, the, these things in. But the point is that after a while, you see the same things over and over again and, and, and hopefully you, you learn to duck. But what I would say is you have a business plan, you know your numbers, you don't fool yourself on, on the numbers, and then the key is ten tenacity. I don't look at it uh, as, as failure. Tenacity and failure are very, very uh, two different things. You're not going to sell everybody, but by the idea of just keeping on going and going, and you have a goal, and you have goals that are measurable and attainable, and every month, week, day, however, whatever the numbers are relevant to test, you test these numbers, you retest the numbers, you retest the numbers, and the reality is, in today's world, if you have a good idea, and I could think of 20 off the top of my head, the ability to get a good idea financed is gotten easier, and it's all, you know, everything, they talk about marketing, marketing is one part, but if you don't have the operational, and you don't understand operational costs, then marketing just exposes a bad product. So understanding operational costs, understanding operational overhead, and always testing things. Test your numbers, test your numbers, test your numbers, test your, you know, in terms of, you had a business plan where you said you wanted to get volunteers. There's, there's a company, which I, a sign of age, I can't think of the name, but it, it's, it's a startup company. The person who started QVC, his grandson started it, and they came up with this concept that they would have college students with, that there are certain jobs where in, in towns where people would want college students. So they signed on and security, storage, driving, you know, driving people from a bar, a designated driver, which would be cheaper than a car service. Um, like literally hundreds of different types of things. And the person who built this business, raises money, raised $2 million from crowdfunding, I think is doing about $8 million in sales. But it, it's, you, you take your, your business plan and you say, well, why would somebody volunteer? Um, so, so, I mean, I think, you know, it's really, you, you, you start with a business plan. Your business plan, I'm sure Ted's gone, gone over. You want to have a mission statement. 
Um, you want to have a clear-cut goal. You want to have quarterly goals. You want to have annual goals. Everybody focuses too much as an entrepreneur on day-to-day. -day. Everybody says, I'm going to build this, and look what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this tomorrow. you got to be thinking a year, two, three, five years in advance because everybody overestimates what they can accomplish in a day or a week and underestimates what they can accomplish in a couple of years. So if you're looking and you say, you know, I want to sell 10,000 units in two years, how do I do that? Where do I have to be? What's the key thing in order to, I, okay, I have to identify my market. How do I get out there? What's my cost per goods? How can I cheapen my cost per goods? With the way social media works, who are common products? You know, all those things that are covered are very, very important. But I, I, I am su such a believer as an entrepreneur in it's goal driven and you have to measure your own goals and, and the, the, the biggest reasons business fail are because they delude themselves. They think their cost, they think they're making X amount of money and they think they why. They think it costs this much to acquire a, um, a, a client and, and it's why. Mm -hmm. So if you're not always looking at it, um, I, you know, and I always find whenever I get surprises in business, they're always bad. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, nobody calls me up and said, hey, that thing we thought was worth three million is worth 12. It's, we, uh, we, 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 yeah, it's, it, it, I will, and, 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 and again, I'm not, I'm not complaining. We, we have a bank and our bank is based on lending mostly to, to law firms. And it was designed to create a specific need it's, it's one of the most profitable banks and has the most profitable products of any bank in the United States. But as a bank, the regulators want you to have mortgages. So unfortunately, we have to have mortgages. And mortgages, to me, in this environment, and again, I don't want to get too technical, but it has something what's called duration risk. So if you lend money in this interest environment and the interest rates go up, you could have a mismatched product. But the, so I, I hate I hate the mortgage business. Although you'd say we were big players in the mortgage business, we're not big players in New York City. But uh, I don't know if you guys remember. About eight months ago, there was a Con Ed where two buildings blew up. We have like five buildings in New York City. Two of those two were, 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 were ours. I mean, we we were insured and it worked out. But so I, 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 I'm just in in a huge huge believer. And knowing your numbers, anticipating what could go, what could go wrong, and I guess you know we're sort of out of time. So the last thing I'll say is, you always, when you look at your business, you have to say, what possibly can go wrong? What are my risk factors? Be think of anything you can with your risk factors, because a lot of times, if you contemplate what your risk factors are in a business, you'll be able to address them before they become or remove them totally from risk factors. The, the, the mortgage example, well, you buy insurance. So we mitigated our risk on a, on a, on a building blower. But, you know, I wish all of you guys luck. You know, the, to me, Ted, when told me about this program, I said, this is the great, I, 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 wish, I wish I was an entrepreneur today. I, you know, I think there's more opportunity. You guys got to just believe in yourselves. Don't, you know, when I was telling my friends I'm going to open medical offices, they, they were sort of laughing at me. And you know, I'd get up at 4.30 in the morning and, and go to work, be, actually before school, and they'd be going out at night. And I just said, well, you know, this is, this is what, I, what I choose to do. So if you have an idea, believe in your idea, know your numbers, have goals, have short-term goals, have long-term goals. And, uh, and, and last thing, as Ted says, you always have to know your customer. Beautiful. So uh, let's first hear it. <laughs> wonderful, uh, wonderful lecture. I mean, a lot of times we, we've heard this year from four of our guest speakers and, uh, who did not focus on the numbers. And we haven't found out whether, uh, uh, whether Dennis has an accounting degree. He must have an accounting degree. Because <laughs> no. No, what was your degree? Uh, my, my my degree was in my degree was in political science. Political oh, science. Okay. 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 I, I, I wanted to. I wanted. I, I want. I actually wanted to teach U.S. history 
That's what I thought I, I, I <laughs> Promoting a bang from teaching in uh, high school, that's a, a big deal. All right, we have time for a couple of questions uh, for Dennis. Yes, sir. So, with the uh, thing, with the, uh, you mentioned the Jeff thing that I mentioned earlier. So, since I'm thinking that it's inevitable for me to become an entrepreneur further down the road, what would you say if I did take on a job with JetBlue or whatever, in the meantime, how to, I guess, increase my, my entrepreneurial IQ while I'm doing something like that? How can I continue setting myself up? But the obvious things, reading, you, you know, in terms of, I, I find, and, and this is a weird one and probably nobody else suggested this, I find listening to a lot of companies I mean, almost every public company has their, they come out with their earnings and they have their investor calls. I find listening to them is, is a great way to go. Things like TED um, is a good organization. There's a lot of organizations now. That I, I really believe crowdfunding is going to disintermediate to traditional investing. So that, that's, that's something where as a young entrepreneur, Understand, look how other people raise money. You know, you, you, you look again, look at your product on crowdfunding. Whatever you could think of on crowdfunding, there's nothing you can think of that's not being offered now. Have something which differentiates you. You know, JetBlue is, and when, and then always be looking. You look at something that JetBlue uh, does, there's lots of offshoots. I had a guy who, who, who worked I had a guy who worked for me, um, and he wanted to go into the blood lab business. And he felt that you know he had an idea of how he could do it and how he could promote it. I ended up financing him and talking about his numbers. I put two million dollars in. I, I probably have gotten seven or eight million dollars back. I get six, seven hundred thousand dollars. The guy did not have grandiose plans. He wanted to stay in a local market. He wanted to cater to um, the, basically the New York Health and Hospital System. He did his own research. He discovered as a minority how minority contracts work. He said, and he started his own business. One of the things, when you get to the point, getting good, the right professionals, getting a good accounting firm that you work with, I mean, down the road, Finding a really good tax lawyer is always important, but <laughs> lawyers are are, are an important prospect and everything. But also just going going to shows, being out there, listening, um, and, and again, I think that crowdfunding is, is such a you know, Kickstarter. Kickstarter has a five hundred million dollar evaluation. They have six million people have signed up. They've raised over a billion dollars. This year, crowdfunding in 2014 was a $14 billion industry. Next year, it's going to be a $50 billion industry. And, and, and we're, we're going to put a billion dollars, so we're going to be 2% of the crowdfunding industry ourselves next year. We think we should, I mean, it, it, as I said, it's sort of funny watching these things, and, and I, I look at myself just and again, it's fooling myself, but looking at myself like you as sort of an entrepreneur and all of a sudden I look at the aggregate sales that our businesses do and we become much more institutional and you know, that's, that's like a worry down the road how to not be institutional and keep the entrepreneurial spirit because this country is totally built and reliant upon entrepreneurs. It's the backbone of America. It's what separates America from, from everything else, and it, it's you know it's you know it's Ted and, and guys like you and people having an idea, believing in the idea, and, and building on it. Beautiful. Good. Last nice question. You talk a lot about even previous presentations as well, selling your companies. At which point do you decide you want to sell your company? Okay, so so I look at now. I'm in a certain different position that, than I was when I started. So I look at different businesses where I want to have my extra strategy when I start in general. So I'll say, okay, well, now, now there's a problem once you reach a certain size because in specialty finance, you know, there's not, I can merge, but there's very few people who are big enough at a certain size to buy you. 
But I would say that I look at investments, and you guys should look at it, five-year plan. Your five-year exit strategy should either be through IPO, or again, I think crowdfunding is going to replace the IPO market, or you have a target. There are people, you know, the Sir Richard Branson, the uh, Sarah, oh God, the girl who invented Spanx. Sarah, I know, now I'm right, embarrassed because if she sees this, I know I feel it well, I can't go last name. So her husband's name is Jesse Itzler. But, 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 but she, had, she had an extra strategy. And I think that going in and saying, you know, you take JetBlue and you say, you know, I have a product and here's four or five buyers. The more buyers or potential buyers, the better, the, the better, the better off it is. But when you start a business, uh, like what I said, I have a different thing. I look at things for myself now as legacy businesses. So I may start a business where I never have any intention of selling. A lot of things I do at, at this point are, are tax-based, based on different tax strategies. But when, in the beginning, when you're starting a business, you should have a five-year business plan. Year one is build the business, the two and three basically, brand the business, get your, year one is build, start the business, get your proof of concept, understand where, how quickly you want to grow. Two, year two and three, proof of concept, really understand the business, figure out your five-year growth plan, and then you're you're in business to make money. I, I mean, there's you should always be looking and, and be listening to an for an exit. Sometimes there are markets that get outpriced. You know, you, you, you look at the tech boom, or you look at the real estate boom. And if you're happy, lucky enough to be in one of these businesses where you have companies trading at 60, 70 multiples, and they're out of whack. You should always have, that's why I always say have a good accountant, have your numbers which are audible, have everything which is provable, because like my first business, I, I, ne I was just lucky. Somebody told me, get a big six accounting firm. If I didn't do that, I don't know if the timing was right, I don't know if I would have been able to, to sell the business. But you have to go in with an exit, you have to, it's a great question, you have to go in with an exit strategy, and your exit strategy should absolutely be defined Here's my 30 buyers, here's my 50 buyers, here's my 60 buyers. And, and, and the last thing I'll say is talking about Google. You know, so it, it's everybody debates whether Facebook or um, Apple are, are overvalued. And, and, and I look at Apple and I think Apple's gonna change TV and I think Apple's actually an undervalued stock. But you look at Google and Google has become so important that um, Google has a private equity firm that if I was designing a business um, now, I would, what Google's advantage in over every other business is Google itself. So if you're able to understand how people are going to use search engines, Google Ventures, I could think of that. So like Google Ventures is, is a great exit company strategy for any new entrepreneur because the ability to attract more eyeballs and leads than anything else, nobody's better at it than Google. They have their own space, they control their own territory, and even when you go to the other search engines, Google understands how to get to the top. So like like the the your your business plan, you know, if Google Ventures buys twenty percent of your company or thirty percent of your company or fifty whatever they need to buy it gives you the sales force and it gives you expertise and that's another thing as a young entrepreneur you know always look be looking for people who you like and and, and that's probably something nobody else has, has said if you're gonna there's always you always have to be looking as an entrepreneur for opportunities so there are similar businesses there are sales forces there are joint ventures make sure that bad business bad people make for bad business so know the people you're going into business with. Don't think this guy has a great business or has a lot of money, so I should be in business. The people you're in business with are the people you live with every day. And it's again, if, if I actually had to go, now that I think of the first thing I would say in terms of business is know who you're in business with, make sure 
I, I have a rule. I only hire nice people. It sounds like a, a simple. It sounds like a silly. We talked rule. about that during this uh, semester. That you know, life's too short. You to but deal you, with people or partners or people that you, you can't get along with. But you could go to any of the companies that that we have, and there's there's, you know, there's a culture there, and it's a rule we don't violate. You know, if, if somebody, I won't mention. You know, we've had opportunities to do business with. Some of the people, the wealthiest people in the world, and I said I don't ever want to be in business where I'm worrying about somebody who's going to try and get an advantage over me. Great. On that note, we're going to have to stop. The rest of the next class is Sorry. this presentation. Okay, so Dennis's lecture will be online, so you can see it again, and uh, he's around. Uh, Blakely. Her name is Sarah Blakely. <laughs> <laughs> Blakely. Okay, Sarah. Good luck with your spanks business. <laughs>